Welcome to the next episode of Quilting Adventures podcast. I am Jackie Russell with Jackie Russell Creates, where we talk about everything quilting, embroidery, needlework, and crafting in general on this podcast. So just create with fabric and floss. Today we're talking about quilting and the different quilting techniques that they had and did in garment making in the 18th century in the embroidery techniques. Wading quilting was used primarily for warmth, which was an essential requirement in the 18th century. Caps and hat were worn indoors where the temperatures were just a little above freezing in the winter. Can you imagine sitting around just a little above freezing? No wonder they wore hats and gloves. I'd have to be wrapped up in several of my quilts and quilted garments. Babies were dressed in quilted caps, mitten, long or leave sleeveless long vests or waist coats that covered their feet. Women wore quilted bonnets that had long ear flaps called lappets. Although these were unfashionable by the 1750s, except for older generations. And on removing their wigs, men wore neatly brimmed four section caps to keep their close cropped heads warm. Other garments were that were quilted included stomachers, stays, bodices, petticoats, pockets, men's waistcoats, and jackets. Flat, corded, and stuffed techniques, on the other hand, were fundamentally just decorative forms of quilting. They were often associated with the wealthier class because of the time-consuming methods involved, and it might be said that costlier materials were used for these techniques, but this is not always true. Weighted petticoats were often made of the richest satins, while plain white linen cloths were preferred for corded quilting. Linen quilted garments would be reserved for summer wear, which would be cooler and more easier to laundry. So let's first talk about weighted quilting. The frame used for weighted quilting was a large slate frame. The exact size depend on the item being produced. Petticoats would approximately be three feet wide and worked sideways. The lining fabric used in usually an inferior quality of fabric to sur- quality to surface the fabric would be stitched to the webbing on the top and the bottom of the rollers. The last would be inserted and the rollers stretched apart as desired in the section of the dressing frame, which we talked about in an earlier podcast. Quilting was not stretched as tightly as other forms of embroidery, as certain amount of looseness or give was required to allow the quilters to work a stitch in one movement instead of up and down. The width between the rollers would only be as far as the quilters could comfortably reach. The corded wool or combed cotton would be laid in an even layer over the lining. Carded wool was the most popular weighting and this was sometimes dyed a strong color so that it would show through the pastel satin. The surface fabric was placed smoothly on top of the weighting. The Layers would be pinned and tacked together at the rolled ends nearest the quilter, and the excess would be allowed to fall over the far end but held up with pins so that it would stay clean. As work progressed, the quilter, quilted fabrics were gently rolled up on the rollers nearest the worker. The sides of the quilting would be stretched by wrapping tape around the legs and attaching the tape to all layers with pins. Again, not too tightly, at about two inches 
intervals to make up length with a fabric were sewn together along the salvage with a back or running stitch. The design could be transferred to the fabric by various methods. It would be traced with a pencil directly off the paper pattern to the fabric with thin enough to see the line through. Templates could be chalked around. White chalk on white leaves almost no marks for on completion, but enough a line to be stitched by. Alternatively, templates could be traced around with a blunt needle, which leaves an impression long enough for the stitch to be worked and again leaves no line afterwards. A ruler would be used for straight lines in filling patterns or stretched chalk string could be placed in position and plucked to leave a reasonable line to stitch along. If the quilting design was very complicated, involving embroidered motifs too, the prick and pounce method would have been used. What layers do you use, or what technique, I should say, do you use to put your quilting motifs on? Do you use a template? Do you use a heat pen, friction pen? Do you use chalk? What do you use? When the layers were prepared, the quilter would begin to stitch. The thread would begin with a small knot, which with a sharp tug can be pulled through the lining and be lodged in the waiting. A back stitch was used to secure the start. And then the work continue with small running stitches. By placing the sewing hand on top of the surface and the other hand below, the needle could be manipulated into taking three or four stitches at a time and work, the work progressed quite quickly. In some examples, backstitch was used to outline the motifs and running stitch for the filling patterns. Backstitch would take longer to work as each stitch had to be worked individually. Each section would be finished with a couple of stitches on top of one another and the end of the sewing thread would be lost in the waiting. In theory, the quilting would be reversible and the quilters could jump from one motif, motif to another by traveling between the layers. However, some examples, the thread can be seen to skip from one line to the next, leaving a long, untidy stitch on the wrong side. You know, that is something that I show and teach is to do go in between the fabrics as you're moving in sections when we're hand quilting the thread was usually silk for satins and linen thread for linen fabric which matched the fabric and color the needles were you the needles used were small and much like modern between needles the thimble would have been worn on the middle finger of the sewing hand and another thimble or finger protector on the hand underneath, which would guide the needle coming up again. Quilting was also worked in the hand, especially in the home by the amateur needlewoman who had little room to set up a big frame. It is also easier to work a back stitch in the hand. For, the met for this method, the layers were spread as described but on a tabletop, then sandwiched of lining, weighting, and top fabric would be <laughs> tacked together from the center outwards. The quilting stitches would also be worked from the center out to prevent the fabric from wrinkling, something that we do today. On completion, the quilt was removed from the frame and the garment assembled. The raw hem edges were turned to the inside or finished with a and finished with a running stitch. Alternatively, the edges were bound a strip of matching fabric or tape, kind of like our binding tape that we use today. The next quilting technique is corded quilting. Corded quilting, sometimes called Italian quilting, required the most skills to work. Two layers of fabric were stitched together in a design which was composed of parallel lines. 
This could be an overall pattern or single motif in stems. The fabric was mounted in a frame as for weighted quilting, but there was no weighting. The stitches used were usually a back stitch for the motifs and a running stitch for the background areas. When the stage was complete, the work was turned over and the channels between the lines of stitching were filled by threading a thick wool and loosely spun linen thread between the layers of fabric. The lining fabric was loosely woven, coarse fabric, which would be pierced with a stiletto to allow a blunt needle to slide between the stitch lines. The needle would come up out of the lining and re-enter to negotiate curves or angles. An unlined piece on an unlined piece, these little entries and exit holes can be seen quite easily. The lines would have been accurately stitched. If too close, the quilt would pucker, but if too far apart, the cords would not appear to be raised. Sometimes the background were worked with parallel lines, but the channels not filled. This gave a textured effect that contrasted well with the tightly stuffed channels. Corded quilting was usually made with a white linen fabric with coarser li lining linen for the lining, although satin bonnets were popular. The thread matched the linen, and the raw edges were bound with tape or turned in on themselves in a running stitch together. Corded quilting was found on gar garments such as petticoats and stomachers, men's waistcoats, and baby clothes. It was popular for summer wear because it was washable. When it was further embellished with surface stitcheries, it was known as Marcel's quilting. The name Marcel's quilting can be confusing, however, because in the 19th century where white machine woven bed covers went under the same name, the bed covers imitated fine hand quilting and were mass produced over well into the 20th century. Very few examples of corded quilting remain intact today as large garments were often cut up and recycled as smaller items such as pockets or baby caps. These can be recognized because the motifs did not fit the garment shapes but ran into the seams. Plain corded quilting without an additional embroidery had fallen out of fashion by the mid-18th century. The next technique is stuffed quilting. This is something that I want to try. If you have tried it, comment below and let us know your experience. Stuffed quilting was sometimes referred as traputo quilting. It was often combined with corded quilting and require the same fundamental techniques. Two layers of fabric were used. The motifs were outlined in small running or back stitches. The frame in which the fabric was stretched was turned over and stuffing inserted by making a small hole in the middle of the motif with a stiletto or a large needle. Corded wool or combed cotton would be pushed through this hole to pad the area tightly. The hole was then manipulated so that the weave of the lining fabric closed over it again. With large padded motifs, the lining fabric would be split open, the padded inserted, and a couple small stitches used to close the hole and keep the weighting in place. As with corded quilting, white linen was the most popular fabric because it, it could be laundried. This type of quilting was very durable and cool for summer wear and was especially popular for children and babies. And the last technique is flat quilting. This form of quilting had two layers of fabric stitched together but didn't have any weighting or padding in between. The double fabric would not have been much warmer than a single layer, but it would have been more weighted and substance. And in some cases, the two layers would have been added a certain stiffness to the garment. As this form of quilting was also decorated with embroidered motifs, 
The additional layer would have helped to reinforce the upper fabric. The top fabric would have been silk, satin, or linen, and the under fabric was usually a coarse linen. The quilted design formed a pleasing textile background to the embroidery as it, it was in matching or pale yellow silk thread. The design was simple diamond, chevron, or luzgen patterns. Although the continuous meander line, known as vermicle, was also very popular. These quilted designs were stitched with a back stitch. The embroidery motifs were worked in curl wool or silk thread in a tasteful floral design on top of the quilting. It could be suggested that the items were purchased readily quilted with the trace motifs prepared for the needlewoman to embroider in her home. On completion, edges were turned in and running or slip stitches or bound with linen tape. So how interesting is that? That is something that I am interested in, in hearing what you may have done. Have you tried any of those different types of embroidery quilting techniques? There's a couple that I want to try. So maybe comment below and let us know your experience. Until then, happy stitching, my friends.